Hi everybody, hope you're well. Uh, today we'll read from a book titled Peach Plant, a Library for Radioactive Afterlife by Susanne Creeman, published by Spector. Lutz Seiler wrote, People generally referred to the two East Thuringian villages in which I grew up as the tired villages. People there, it was said, were apathetic and listless, and they themselves even complained about their perennial fatigue and wondered about those strange moments when they were somehow absent. There was a heaviness there which hung over everything, over the seemingly endless series of days in the courtyard, over the garden, in the labyrinth of the outbuildings of the half-dead post-collectivization estate. A large, four-sided farmyard with feed rooms, a laundry room, garages, stalls and hay barns with unused wagons, next to which stood a five-meter-high threshing machine that would emit satanic noises and give me the impression that sooner or later I would be called into its hoppers and chewed apart. Everywhere there were ditches of slurry and water that children might have the inclination to fall into, simply because they had heard so many grave warnings from their concerned parents. A bizarre mountain delimited the world of the tired villages and shaped the horizon of my childhood, the slag heaps and tailing ponds beneath which lay the ore, the uranium. When the American occupying forces pulled out of Thuringia in 1945 and as a countermeasure Berlin was divided into sectors, they managed to overlook something in particular, pitch blend. Black and glistening like meconium, those cryptocrystalline uranium stones down in the earth are its heaviest natural element. Strangely, the East German storage sites were forgotten by the Allies. James Beers, then Secretary of State, had explained that the Soviet Union could not produce atomic bombs, as there were no uranium deposits in Russia. After the Americans' departure, though still in 1945, Russian geologists discovered the East German uranium deposits. One year later, the only communistic stock company in German soil, the Soviet-German AG Wismut, began to take fissionable material for Russian atomic bombs out of the earth. The Americans' monopoly on the atom bomb had been broken. The uranium stockpiles, their ash-grey emissions, the thin, hair-like covering of birches at the foot of this mountain belong to the horizon of my childhood, as for others maybe the Alps do, or the eaves of a neighboring row of houses. When I draped myself across the gate, that opened back out onto the fields. The horizon reached all the way into my dreams. My father tells the story of how one morning he awoke to find a drilling rig in the garden. A neighbor said, there's one in mine too, and at the same time, the way to the next village had disappeared, excavated away, buried alive. Thuringia became the third largest uranium extraction site in the world, after sites in the US and Canada. At the time, half a million people were employed there. The miners worked in shifts, but were paid well, had to wait less time to order their automobiles and had a monthly ratio of four bottles of brandy, duty-free. 0.7 liters cost just 1.17 marks. Made inside the plant itself, the mountain workers called it miners' death. If anything, their sense of humor was macabre, a combination of knowledge and ignorance. When my grandfather would get back home from the pit in the mornings, we would sit in the kitchen in front of the radio. He would come over to us and wave his hand above its wooden casing, and immediately the music would thin out into another worldly clicking and crackling. As soon as he pulled his hand away, the ghost would disappear and Bavarian radio would return. We were impressed, and he would laugh. 
I also remember the oppressive feeling this invisible power had over me when my grandfather would affectionately place his hands upon my head. In the distance, the space we knew had become a landscape of slug heaps. A world subjected to the force of a dancing rod stretching from the Antarctic to the Earth's mountains. Uranium, pitch blend, isotope 235. Those neuroses reached deep into the ground. By the time Gottfried Benz Ptolemais was published in 1949, East German uranium mining had already managed to extract the first of 220,000 tons of uranium from the Earth. In the end, 500 million tons of radioactive waste was to remain behind in East Germany. But we didn't think about force or neurosis when we looked at the slug heaps. It was only at night, with an ear to the bed frame, that you thought you could hear something moving under the earth, something like what Wagner's Wojciech must have heard when he stamped to the ground and said, it's all hollow down there. I can remember the strange feeling under my soles when I thought I was walking across particularly thin ground. Tired villages. What a beautiful way to describe the effect of low doses of constant radiation, which is why there were no weeds, and which is also why, even in the most glorious battles of my imagination, I could not protect myself. Of those who worked in the uranium mines, very few made it past 60. When one looks a little more closely at the uranium-producing parts of East Germany, for example at the high frequency of blood disease and cancer, which had already begun to be noticed in the 1980s, discussions of castor transports and disposal sites appear in a rather strange light. The former mining company, today a restoration company, is however still known by the cover name it once received from the Stalin administration, Bismut. In the year 2000, parts of the slug heaps made up a section of the German contribution to the International Expo exhibit, and in 2007 the National Garden Show laid its lovely and dark mother earth over the wound. A memorial mine was constructed. The actual tunnels, which wind for over 1,000 kilometers through the bowels of the earth, were closed off due to radiation concerns. A glass pavilion was already been erected where the holy, bad Ronnenberg spring waters were discovered in 1666. As to the spring itself, it disappeared with the construction of the mine and has never been seen again. In the meantime, it is a well-known fact that wherever the Navajo Indians of North America built their holy images out of sand, ground maize and crushed blooms, uranium was to be found in the earth. The Holy Land, where for generations there had been warnings about invisible dangers, was radioactive. The largest underground uranium mine on earth is supposed to be in Mount Taylor, the Navajo's holy mountain. In the Black Hills of South Dakota, uranium mining destroyed the Sioux holy sites. Generations of native people, Navajo or Sioux, had traveled across the country precisely to find those very places for the invocation of their spirits. The Shining Stone was also present in the fields around Ronnenburg, but we had never had to seek out the place. We were already there. Why should the trance-like quality of such places not have affected us just as strongly? One person makes mandala, another person a poem. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.